Actually speaking, Krishna and Arjun are not separate. Arjun is the illusioned and confused mind. Krishna is the center of that mind. That is the relationship between Krishna and Arjun. Krishna is the heart of Arjun. That within you, which already knows, is Krishna. to have you here and have this discussion with you. I have been watching your videos, your thoughts on women empowerment, and you are the chief guest on International Women's Day. So by being a man, conditioned to this patriarchal Indian society, what sensitized you towards women's issues? And what made you advocate for women's rights? Can you please share your personal journey? So my thanks to the institution and the dignitaries thereof for uh, organizing this event on this highly significant day and uh, inviting me here and uh, I love visiting educational institutions in fact when I was witnessing the debate uh, some part of me was kind of feeling eager to join the debate. My earliest memories of AIMS uh, date back to the mid-90s when I would uh, visit AIMS Delhi in their cultural festival and be a participant in their cultural program, debates and extemporary competitions and these things. So thank you, thank you once again. And now I'll try to address your question. So her question is, uh, being a man, why do I take up women's issues? Or why am I interested in uh, women's liberation at all? See, we are all born selfish people, right? Nobody can, even if he or she tries to think really beyond uh, his own self. It says that the definition of the self can keep getting purified and elevated as one progresses through life. Hmm? Uh, but irrespective of the definition of the self, it's with self-interest that one works. So, it is in my own self-interest that I uh, advocate the welfare and the liberation of uh, all mankind. And uh, Mankind obviously includes women. We are talking of humankind. Mankind is just probably a bit of a misleading word. So when I look at my life, I fully well know that I can't be in peace. I can't do what uh, I must do. And this world which is essentially my world, because I live in it, this world cannot be a place worth living in if half its human residents are, uh, are suffering or are unable to realize their potential. Hmm? So do not look at uh, women's liberation as different from that of men, right? They are interlinked and if one has to be free, then everybody has to be free. So that's what uh, gets me started every day. I'm pretty sure this is not going to be very clear right in the beginning, but we have a lot of time, so things will be as we go along, right? Yes, please. Feminism is 
often seen in uh, poor lights. Feminists are often considered as mere haters and non-conformists. Being a Vedan teacher, can you shed some light on feminism from Vedan perspective? From a Vedantic perspective, what is feminism? First of all, what is patriarchy? Hmm? When we talk of a thing, Vedanta asks, where does the thing come from? Hmm? Be it a system, an action, anything. The deed, the action, will not uh, yield itself to your insight if you do not understand its origin, its genesis. So, where does this thing called patriarchy come from? Vedant says it comes from Prakriti. Hmm? Our biological nature, the way our bodies are configured, hmm? not by the society, but by biology itself. So you see, that which we call as patriarchy is a continuation of our prakritic bondage. Hmm? Otherwise, it couldn't have uh, survived, rather flourished for so long and almost all over the globe. There is a reason why men and women have been so far being related through a particular equation. That equation seems to be coming from men, but it is actually coming from Prakriti. You understand Prakriti? Hmm? The biological nature, which, which, is, which is the nature of our bodies, which is the nature of all that we see around us, right? All, all the material things that we see around us. Hmm? The nature of, of, of the material world as against the nature of consciousness. That's what I'm calling as Prakriti. So we'll take these two together, right? Prakriti and consciousness, Prakriti and Chetna. Hmm? And we'll take these two for the purposes of uh, this discussion as exclusive to each other, though they really are not, but just to simplify things, we will do that. So the way our bodies are configured, hmm? the male body, the female body, there is a particular equation between the man and the woman. And that equation is favored not only by the biological man, but also by the biological woman. Otherwise, it couldn't have been possible for this system to run for so long. Hmm? What I'm essentially saying is that given the way our animal bodies are, not only men, but also women have had a stake in patriarchy, right? Think of it. If half of the world's population decides to disown something, decides to rebel against something, can the thing still stand and continue and flourish for so long? It just cannot, right? Further, this is not a phenomena that's uh, local to one part of the world. We cannot call it merely a cultural thing. We cannot call it an accident happening at some place due to some reason. We find the same thing in its various variants everywhere. In fact, we find the same thing in its various variants even in the animal kingdom. It's just that humans with their propensity and power to distort all that can be distorted, to corrupt all that can be corrupted, have corrupted the biological system even more. For, hmm? This has to be understood. So there has to be a way to come out of this system, right? Because we do not have a proper name for the way to come out of the system that, that, uh, that puts us in the bondages 
of a biological relationship between the man and the woman. Therefore, we call it feminism. And therefore, we take the goal of feminism as gender equality. Vedant would say equality is a high ideal, but liberation is the purpose of life, right? So not equality as such, because equality takes you so far and no more. What men and women both need is not so much equality, but really liberation from their biological selves. And as long as the man is the biological man that evolved from the jungle, and as long as the woman continues to be the biological woman who has emerged from the jungle, their relationships would remain material and biological and mutually exploitative. That is, that is patriarchy. It's great that there is an attempt to uproot that system, but it has to be understood that patriarchy is not just an ideology. It is coming from the, our very biological bondages. Therefore, the, the solution cannot be ideological. The solution has to be spiritual. Are we getting it? So, Vedantic feminism would say, disown your physical self. You are much beyond that girl, much beyond that. As long as you continue to identify with your body, as long as you relish calling yourself a girl or a woman, there can be no freedom for you. And ditto for the man. As long as you say, I am the woman, I am the woman, there's a great problem. Vedant says, the body of the woman is her cage, just as the body of the man is the man's cage. What do you mean by freedom as a woman? Freedom as a woman would mean freedom remaining within your cage. The body is the cage, the body is the cage that the consciousness wants to exceed, that the consciousness wants to get rid of. If you want to retain the cage and still talk of freedom, it's not going to happen. So you have to disidentify from your biological self. And the moment you disidentify from your biological self, you have also gone beyond your biological mandate. And you very well know what is your biological mandate. In Prakriti, the man's job is to be the hunter, the gatherer, the provider. Hmm? You look at the jungle and you will find this happening all the time. In Prakriti, the woman's life is centered around the nest, the eggs, the kids. If you do not exceed your biological self, you will be ill-fated to remain exactly as the female species in the jungle remain. Unfortunately, because we deal so much in ideologies and uh, too little in wisdom, therefore, the women's liberation movement is talking a lot in terms of rights, a lot in terms of opportunities, without bothering to inquire whose rights and opportunities for what? Hmm? Rights to whom? Are you trying to give rights to the biological woman? What will she use those rights for? She will use those rights for the same purposes that the biological man has been using his rights for. The biological mandate is to eat, sleep and be happy and procreate a lot before you die. If you give rights without wisdom, that's what rights are going to be used for. Though in a more polished way, though in a more sophisticated way, but at the core would remain just the biological urge. Give me more rights, I'll do more of what I have been doing all throughout the course of history, right? This is complicated, is it? 
it's actually quite simple if you look at it directly if you look at it directly it's very very simple to understand right do not try to fit this within the existing narratives otherwise you'll be uh, confused yes is that applause or the good old indicator that we are it's time hmm? just one last question acharya yeah so uh, i was just wondering india has been the seat of wisdom and knowledge throughout the ages the past that we had in history and now we us we should be so proud of such scriptures vedanta upanishads and all where did we go wrong and why how did we drop these things and so how do we why do we have to now reconsider them and take so much effort to bring them back to life what happened see when you have lots of spiritual literature when you have generations after generations of scholars of seers rishis and saints it gives you the false confidence that you know hmm? and that confidence is very very dangerous there are countries lands people who are not uh, so richly blessed with a spiritual heritage right our problem is that our spiritual heritage is just too big and because it is just too big it has thrown us into a false confidence that we are indeed spiritual people whereas we are not hmm? every house has a place of worship people keep religious books at their homes though they never read them hmm? but just keeping the book and just having the dt hmm, in your house this gives you the assurance that you know that you are in touch with the sacred or the divine right so that is the problem too much of spirituality without any substance the real thing is missing you asked where did we go wrong this is in general where we go wrong otherwise in particular every kid that is born is a thing improper in itself not the birth is improper but the kid is born as something that needs to be addressed it needs to be addressed just as a patient needs to be addressed the society might indeed be highly religious or wise or whatever but every new kid that is born it starts from minus 100 because it is born with all the old animal tendencies right so it's then not like scientific knowledge in science the knowledge that one generation has is used by the next generation right so newton gave you something and those who came after newton worked on what newton gave us wisdom does not work like that every generation has to start from zero rather minus 100 minus 100 you cannot rely on the work done by your forefathers even if the forefathers have left a lot for you still you have to start from minus 100 we thought that because the forefathers have done so much for us therefore we are automatically blessed and that's where we went wrong we'll have to work our own way to liberation our forefathers can't help us beyond a point right thank you thank you so much